man. I ain't paying you to be Michael Myers. I'm playing Michael Myers. You're going to ruin the whole effect. I done it. Trick or treat. Dirty birdie. <laughs> I think we can all agree Michael Myers was terrifying. Taking into account the original Halloween wasn't released in the UK until late January 1979. This was the time of year when they'd often throw any old hokum at cinemas just to get bums on seats. When everyone was out of pocket after Christmas and preferred to all sit in front of the TV watching Ted Rogers confusing somebody out of a new family car than braving the city centre in a barrage of sleet and zero degrees. But it picked up a buzz anyway quite a buzz. Bear in mind this was 15 years before the internet and social media, but this shoestring budget gap filler was becoming an instant classic through word of mouth alone. Bringing in over 200 times its budget at the box office and catapulting director John Carpenter into the big league, whether he was comfortable there or not. And this was not just because it was a throwaway slasher, it was never going to be that, as John's earlier work had shown. With the visceral assault on Precinct 13 already cementing his style. No, this was a bit of magic. The cast, and subsequently the characters, were unique and engaging. The pacing, considered slow by today's standards, is deliberate in doing exactly what it should do. Because by the time we realise Laurie Strode is in extreme peril, we are absolutely there with her and we never ever forget her. And every frame of this movie is meant to be there, every hue of its colour palette, every sweep of the Panaglide camera. This isn't just a horror film, it's an exercise in damn near perfection. It became clear pretty quickly there was going to be a sequel. Now remember this wasn't a franchise at this time, Carpenter and co-writer Deborah Hill had already moved on to the fog but the studio and fans wanted a return of the shape. So despite their reluctance, they crafted the sequel for two, while bravely appointing total rookie Rick Rosenthal to direct. And Rosenthal did one hell of a job, credit where credit's due, respecting the feel, colours and film stock of the original. Despite ramping up the gore and the clumsy flashbacks from Laurie, it felt right. Right from that blinding opening sequence, some kind of joke. I've been trick or treated to death tonight. You don't know what death is. We were buckled in and ready for the ride. And Myers died, didn't he? Laurie shot him in both eyes, and Loomis blew himself and Michael to smithereens to save Laurie. A bittersweet but fitting end. But then someone had to spoil it, didn't they? And that someone was the fans. Carpenter and Hill's idea was to bring a fresh story set around Halloween each year. That's why we got the criminally underrated season of The Witch. Universal, I believe, insisting on the Halloween 3 title, with everyone then, who hadn't bothered to check first, which seemed to be just about everyone, sat with their overpriced pick and mix waiting for Michael Myers to pop up from beyond the grave for an hour and a half. Leaving the theatre feeling cheated serves them right because Halloween 3 was the last movie that really felt like a Halloween film. It had the tone, the palette, the synth score we were beginning to know and love from Carpenter and Alan Howarth. But no, cinema goers wanted Myers back, despite the creator's wishes and despite it making little sense. 
Happy Halloween. So, six years later, they... I say they, though I believe Mustafa Akkad was to blame. Can we just say ka-ching? He picked the crusty bits off Michael and Dr. Loomis. Loomis has now got a limp. A limp. And Michael Myers has been in a coma for six years. Laurie Schrode had died in a car crash. I beg your pardon, not on my watch. Laurie was as much a part of the legend as Michael. No Laurie, no Halloween. And up pops Michael. <laughs> all ready to tidy up any remaining family ties. That said, Halloween 4 isn't too bad. Danielle Harris, as Laurie's daughter Jamie, is pretty great. And it moves along at a competent, though somewhat diluted pace. Halloween 4 isn't bad. But then, oh boy. From 5, it started to feel a bit pointless slash silly. The original brilliance was getting completely lost in over-familiarity, convoluted plot twists and increasingly hokey hair and masks. By 6, oh I can't remember. Can you? Does anyone care? Secret cults, ancient runes and a man in black. This is why I had such high hopes for H2O, and it took me a long time to work out why I found it something of a lost opportunity, and I think it's because it felt like a Scream knockoff. And as Scream had already paid homage to the master two years earlier, H2O still felt like it was retreading old ground, not breaking it. Then, just to add insult to injury, <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, this is Rick Rosenthal. What was he thinking? Although Laurie did have her raggedy hand doll. Nice touch. But Michael Myers is so much more than just a gradually diminishing franchise. And I'm saying this because many, many eons ago, I read the Curtis Richards novelization that accompanied the original film because, well, this was pre-VHS and I was too young to see an ex-certificate movie in the theatre. If you should spot a copy going cheap, by the way, maybe in a bookstore or online, grab it and guard it with your life. Have you seen the prices it can fetch? But the book, as I remember, hints towards the origins of young Michael's actions, and it's not sibling hatred or bullying. Rob Zombie, take note, it lies in evil, ancient and palpable. Almost like a living thing moving throughout the world for centuries and occasionally, randomly, selecting a host. In this case, the innocent young Myers child. Michael? And to Carpenter and Hill, he was simply the shape, relentlessly waiting, walking and killing. Dick and Dick and Dick and Dick and Dick. 